From Atlanta, Georgia, this is Southwind. Southwind is a weekly series of features and documentaries on the people, issues, and events in the South today. At WABE in Atlanta, I'm Boyd Lewis. We welcome correspondent Ted Rubenstein to this edition of Southwind. With the advent of the baseball season, Ted felt a twinge of nostalgia for the way the sport was before superstations, multi-million dollar contracts, agents, free agents, and billboards that blink, whistle, and hoot with more enthusiasm than the people in the stands. That was when the Atlanta Crackers commanded Ponce de Leon Park in Atlanta and became the best minor league baseball team in history. Here is Ted's report. Never before or since had Atlanta given its heart so totally to a sports team. The field where they played is now the parking lot of a failed discount store. The old-timers who drive past the site on Ponce de Leon Avenue may hear the long-gone echoes of the crowds, cheering on the exploits of players with names like Country Brown, Bob Montag, and Nat Peoples, who played against teams with names like the Pelicans, the Barons, and the Bears. Atlanta loved this team, and this team repaid Atlanta with the most successful minor league team in baseball history that won more pennants than any other team except the mighty New York Yankees. This team had a mirror image of itself, just as successful, just as popular, and it too came from Atlanta. Only in those segregated times, that team was black. Both teams are gone now, and Ponce de Leon Park is buried. But those who remember remain. So let's take a trolley car ride out Ponce de Leon to the old ballpark, leaving the world of millionaire gentleman athletes and non-stop cable TV sports and go to where the air of true sport hangs fragrant in the air, fragrant as sweat and flannel and hot dog relish, back to the best ballpark that ever was, where the big lights shine on the leaves of the old magnolia tree smack in the middle of center field. Let's watch the Atlanta Crackers play ball. Hello, everybody. Ernie Harwell from Ponce de Leon Park. The Atlanta Crackers on opening night against the Birmingham Barons. And we've got a good turnout here at Old Ponce de Leon, a crowd of about uh, 13 or 14,000. The weather is pleasantly warm, and we're looking forward to action here at the beginning of the 1946 baseball season. Ernie Harwell was the radio voice of the Crackers on WATL and WBGE, which, like the team, no longer exists. Currently, he broadcasts for the Detroit Tigers. Ponce de Leon Park was uh, situated across from uh, Sears Roebuck on Ponce de Leon Avenue, down in uh, somewhat of a dell, and uh, surrounded by Highway 78, I believe it was, and the railroad track up in right field. The uh, left field line was rather long. It was about 355 down the left field line to the uh, bleachers. There were bleachers uh, toward the uh, uh, left field in the corner past third base. And, uh, the stands were in uh, good shape. They seated at the time I was there, I'd say overall uh, 10 or 12,000 people. And behind the third base stands was a swimming pool. And it was, uh, it was Spiller's swimming pool at that time. The ballpark originally was owned by Rel Jackson Spiller. And if the game got a little bit dull, the people on the third base side could go up and uh, turn around, turn their backs to the diamond, and they could watch the uh, bathing beauties in the swimming pool. And the ball would often uh, come off the bat, go over the grandstand roof, and land, actually land in the swimming pool. So you'd, you'd have a wet ball there that people would be diving for. Ted Rubenstein of Atlanta, who conducted these interviews for Southwind, is a lifelong sports buff and in recent months has been researching the history of the Atlanta Crackers, for over 60 years the most beloved and the winningest sports team the city ever had. They started out in 1902 at Piedmont Park, but then they moved to uh, where the Thor building is now across from Sears on Ponce de Leon, which was called Ponce de Leon Park. Used to be a big spring there. 
across the street from the park where the Sears, Sears building is now was Spiller's Fountain of Youth. And the crackers were owned by R.E. Spil- Spilner. Spilner at the time. There was a roller coaster, picnic grounds, and a spa. And then across from that was the baseball park. Spiller started playing there in the 1900s. Uh, that park burned down, though, in 1923, a real famous fire that, that burned down the park. So the Crackers in 1923 finished out the season at Grant Field. Tech let them use it. And in the off-season, they built a new park, which was the new Ponce de Leon Park, which was called by many the best minor league park in the country. And that's where the Crackers finished, and it was demolished in 1965 after it was sold at auction. Earl Mann, the owner of the Crackers, during the auction, uh, they, it was a big hoopla. You know, it was a five-hour auction. It was a big deal. A lot of dignitaries were there, and uh, Earl Mann had the organist play the Star Spangled Banner one last time at the ballpark. This is Bob Montag talking, incidentally, former Cracker. And uh, Ted and I are going to have a little fun talking about the old Crackers. Yeah, I came here in 1952 from Milwaukee for about, I stayed here about three weeks, and then I got recalled by Milwaukee and went back up. And then I came here to stay, really, the way it worked out in 1954, and I stayed here right through 59 when I managed the Crackers, and that's when I ended my baseball career. Bob Montag was a left-handed power-hitting outfielder who remains one of the most popular Crackers of all time. Many of the, the old Cracker fans will remember up and back of right field, uh, the trains used to, that's where the railroad tracks were. And this particular night, there was a freight train sitting up there, and the, back then it was the engine and the coal tender. And uh, we'd look up, and you'd see the guys sitting up there, and they'd always sit there for maybe five or ten minutes, watch an inning or two if they could before they'd take off, and then they'd make up the time on the road between here and Nashville. Well, this particular night, I hit one over up on the railroad tracks, but it landed in the coal tender. And I didn't know this until about three or four days later. uh, Old Doc Jarvis, our trainer, called me. He said, hey, Bob, there's somebody out here who wants to talk to you. So I go out, and here's this fellow with a baseball. And he said, uh, I would like for you to autograph the ball. And I said, oh, where did you get it? He said, well, remember the one you hit the other night up on the railroad tracks? And I said, yeah. He said, well, it landed in the coal tender, and I went in and got it. And I said, oh. And he said, yeah, this has got to be the longest home run that was ever hit in the history of baseball. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, it's 259 miles to Nashville. So the round trip made it 518 miles. And he said, I don't think anybody ever hit a ball that far. Oh, well, uh, first the magnolia tree out in center field where all of our um, players, Matthews and Country Brown and Chuck Tanner and all those boys used to hit the ball to the outfield. And I don't know, it was just... um, The whole thing was just... I had wonderful friends on the team and... The fans and the stadium. Miss Pearl Sandow has been attending baseball games in Atlanta since 1934. She has not missed a single here. game yeah, of the Crackers' successors, like the Atlanta Tom Braves. And Larry Miller. One of the things that I remember most was when it would rain, you know, we didn't have a cover for the field, and they would pour gasoline on the infield and set it on fire. And I know we used to sit in the stands and watch them burn it off so they could play ball or rest. Of course, they couldn't do it now. Gasoline's too expensive. <laughs> but then, oh, I've seen them so many times just burn the field off, uh, you know, so they could play after rain. Uh, do you have any particular moments that you remember in ball games that were particularly exciting to you with the Crackers? Uh, no, I remember some funny things. On the last day one year, I remember Jim Salt was catching, and the batter came up, and the pitcher threw what he thought was a ball, and it was a white potato, and that, the batter hit it, and it just splashed everywhere. Of course, the, the last game didn't I mean there was nothing riding on it. We weren't trying to win the penny. They were just little funny things like that. They enjoyed the game. They just enjoyed, had a good time. 
Do you think they enjoyed the game more than players do now? Uh, yeah. After we got agents, I hate to say it, but agents are the bane of my existence. I just don't like agents. And I think now the Crockers used to come in the ballpark with comic books. Now they come in with the Wall Street Journal <laughs> and there. And, uh, but I, I love the players now, and I don't blame them for making more money, as much money as they can, but I do think that sometimes they go a little overboard because the agent wants his share, and sometimes the player really is not at fault in his agent. Earl Mann began his baseball career by selling peanuts outside Ponce de Leon Park. By 1949, he owned the team and the stadium. What do you think about it? Do you miss it? Are you nostalgic? Or how do you feel? If I miss it, I'd love to be back there operating the Atlanta Crackers. I think it'd be a great thing. It's too bad it had to happen like it did, but it not only put me out of, out of business, out of baseball, but many others. Of course, there's hardly any minor leagues left now, and the only ones that are left are operated by major league clubs and paid for by them, or they wouldn't have any ball players. Think what a wonderful experience it was with a, in a great city with been fortunate enough to have many good ball clubs. Atlanta Cracker star Bob Montag. I'm sure you've been in the big league clubhouse. I'm sure you've been in Atlanta Stadium, the Braves clubhouse, and you walk in there and you're in another world. Air conditioning, carpeting, hair dryers, I mean the works, washers and dryers for everything. Well, see back when I was playing in an old Ponsilian ballpark, we had a big fan in the window and that was our area and at the half the time that thing didn't work. But we would go on a road trip and you had one uniform. All right, you go on a 10 or 12 day road trip, you wore that uniform for 10 or 12 days and you weren't the most popular when it came to a roam around. And uh, even at home, uh, the uniforms were picked up every Saturday night after wearing them all week, they're picked up every Saturday night and dry cleaned so that on Sunday you smell good. But uh, the, those road trips, oh boy, the trainer used to pray that uh, the sun would be shining next morning. See, he'd go out, and as you know, the weather gets awful hot down there in the summertime. And he would go out early the next morning and hope the sun was shining to hang the uniforms out so they'd dry. Well, if it happened to be raining in the morning, there were a lot of cases where we got to the ballpark, say, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the uniform was still wet. And they were flannel. And I don't mean lightweight flannel. They were heavy. And you'd actually, uh, it could wear you out just carrying that uniform around when it got wet. Nobody remembers anything bad. After all, they were the most successful baseball franchise in the history of minor league baseball and the second most successful franchise in the history of organized baseball period, save only the New York Yankees. Oh, yeah, well, Ponce de Leon Ballpark was a good ballpark for anybody. It was, it was a pretty ballpark. It was one of the nicest parks, uh, I guess, that I played in my 16-year career of professional baseball. Describe it to us. Why was it so nice? Well, it was just a beautiful ballpark. And, of course, uh, back then in those days, the only thing you had in Atlanta was Georgia Tech and the Crackers. And uh, people was just a year-round thing. When Georgia Tech was playing sports, everybody went to see Georgia Tech. Then when the summer rolled around, everybody went out to Ponce de Leon Ballpark. So it was a real social event, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, I wouldn't say social, but uh, it was entertainment. And uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, the ball players today don't provide like we used to, is the fact that we knew that we were entertainers, even though we were professional ball players. We were out there to do our best and put on a good show for the people. And I think down through the years, any Cracker fan knows that the Atlanta Crackers did just that. Well, what do you mean by putting on a good show? Well, we hustled. We loved to play. Now, we were naturally getting paid. We were making money, but we didn't know what it was to make 100, 
200, $300,000. We didn't even know what that meant. Nobody back then knew. We were making like my top salary, I think was around $2,000 a month. And I thought I was in high cotton. I didn't know any better. The Southern Association <clears throat> over the years was probably one of the top leagues in the country because it was well balanced. Uh, no team was really completely out of the pennant race until you got say in the last couple of weeks of the season you'd have uh, said team maybe in last place but it'd be only 10 or 12 ball games out of first place so there was always a chance that uh, you could dump somebody and uh, end up winning a pennant do you think ever civic pride got into these rivalries that it was actually you know the quality of a city versus the quality of a city it seems like the birmingham whenever you, you often open opening day with barons it seems when looking back through the paper well, the big thing there was the fact that baseball was big. And I mean big in the Southern Association. So it was community, and there was a lot of pride involved, plus the fact that, uh, as you know, for many years, uh, Birmingham was fighting Atlanta to be the big city in the South. And if it hadn't been for old Mayor Hartsfield, the late Mayor Hartsfield, why Birmingham may be the Atlanta of the South now, because Hartsfield was the one that was prominent in bringing the the big airport into Atlanta, and that's what stole the the gold away from Birmingham, so to speak. Now, you talking about crackamania? They had crackamania from both ends, black crackers and the Southern League Crackers. We won't use the word white crackers, Southern League Crackers. In the 1930s, sports, like everything else in Atlanta, was segregated. Paralleling the success of the Crackers was the Atlanta Black Crackers of the Negro League, owned by local service station operator John Harden. Hometown product Chico Renfro worked his way up from Bat Boy for the Black Crackers in 1937 to become an all-star shortstop for the Kansas City Monarchs. He recalls that John Harden was the only black team owner in Negro League Baseball. The guy that really uh, brought the Black Crackers to light, where everybody paid loads of attention to him all over the United States, was uh, John Harden, a service station uh, operator. He owned a service station on Auburn Avenue. He and his wife uh, purchased the Black Crackers and, and made them first class. They hired the, ball, the best ball players from all over the, the, the Southeast. It was no longer just a local group playing with the Black Crackers. They had, uh, on third place, they had a, a youngster from Stone Mountain by the name of Hody Glenn. At shortstop, they had a local youngster out of high school who was the greatest shortstop ever born, P.I. Butts. And this Pepper Gabby Kemp, who I talk about all the time, Second baseman, he was the manager. And the great Red Moore, he was the first baseman off from Atlanta. And uh, Mrs. Harden and Mr. Harden made sure that the, the salaries were adequate at that time. They, they, the ball players uh, were put up in the best uh, hotels wherever they, uh, they stayed. And uh, that was uh, the advent of really a big time Atlanta, crack, Atlanta black cracker baseball in Atlanta, Mr. and Mrs. Harden, the owner. Weren't they black? Yeah. James Red Moore played for the Atlanta Black Crackers in the late 1930s and finished his career with the Newark Eagles. Some say Moore, an Atlanta native, was the best fielding first baseman in Negro League history. Well, the only thing that, you know, coming up young and starting, I just, you just didn't see, they, they weren't integrated. That's, that's the only thing that you can see because, see, the, the, the caliber of baseball, you couldn't tell too much difference in the caliber of ball that we see from the, the black players on, on the level, on certain levels, I mean, because a lot of uh, the black players, when they started integrating, they didn't have to have any, any pre-training or anything. They were already good enough to play in the major leagues. So, see, we were more or less uh, able to play, but because of the color of our skin, we didn't just get the, get the opportunity. That's the only thing that, after growing older, you understand, coming up earlier, it, it didn't, uh, I didn't have any knowledge that I was going to be able to play in any way, you understand? I mean, I'm glad that I was able to be a part of it, and people thought that I were, were good enough to play, and I've heard them say that 
if I'd had uh, had an opportunity, probably I could have made the the uh, major league team because I did play as high as I could uh, before the integration came. You understand? I was playing as high as we could go. As black ball players couldn't go no higher than the uh, American League and the National League per se. So I would say that I'm proud of what I accomplished and what I did and everything. But I I don't regret the, anything that I've done on, and, I, and I'm not. Uh, boisterous or angry with anything that happened because it said that I probably was born too early. That's all, you understand? You know, every day it brings about a different uh, a time, you understand, because you have to grow into certain things, certain areas, you understand? And so, see, we have a lot of different accomplishments even since uh, the death of uh, King, see? Jackie Robinson's breaking of baseball's color barrier in 1947 signaled the beginning of the end of the Negro League. Black fans no longer wanted to see their stars playing only against one another. As a new decade turned the corner, a technological monster was spawned that would all but devour the independent minor league owner as television began flexing its muscles. Skip Carey, current Braves television broadcaster, did Cracker play-by-play -play for two years and broadcast the Cracker's last game in Atlanta. The number one major league uh, television, which hurt all the minor leagues, and number two, the uh, as Atlanta expanded as a city. They moved from the Southern Association where they played for so many years, I think this was in the early 60s, into the International League. And so some of the pizzazz of the great rivalries they had with Nashville and Birmingham and Chattanooga, New Orleans and, and Knoxville, some of the other cities, was gone when they're playing teams like Syracuse and Rochester and the like. And everybody knew, I think, that Major League Baseball was around the corner. So uh, when I broadcast the games, and that was half of 1963, all of 1964 and 1965, really there wasn't a whole lot of interest. We didn't have very good ball clubs either. Again, Bob Montag. I know what really hurt the Crackers and Southern Association baseball were the big league ball clubs in that uh, when a guy was going good, he'd get off to a good start. The AAA club or the big league club would call him up, so that would naturally hurt the minor league affiliation. So in other words, uh, you would start off the season with a pretty strong pennant contender. By the time the parent club or the club that you were work, you had your working agreement with would take all your good ball players away from you and you'd have to call guys up from lower classifications that weren't really ready for the type of baseball that was being played in the Southern Association. So in other words, the quality was going down and First thing you know, you were three or four games out in front in first place. After a couple of weeks with the inexperienced ball players, you'd end up in second or third, maybe fourth place. So this is a direct result, therefore, of the changeover from being an independently run baseball club right. to... See, most of the ball clubs in the Sun and Association were independently owned, mm -hmm. like Earl Mann, um, Larry Gilbert in Nashville, uh, Guy in Chattanooga. Yeah, uh, Joe Angle. He was called the Barnum of the Bushes. These guys were all promoters along with making professional ball players because Earl Mann sold a number of ball players like Willard Marshall, Davey Williams to the big leagues for prices up around fifty, sixty thousand bucks. And you talk back in the forties and fifties, you're talking about a lot of money. So. Back then, the independent owners were able to operate strictly because they would bring ball players along and sell them to the big leagues. But then along came the farm system. And that's when the big league clubs started supplying, signing bonus players and signing players, and they had to have some place to send them. So consequently, they would end up with working agreements. The Crackers were run as a farm team of the Los Angeles Dodgers from 1960 until 1965. That last year, the team played in Atlanta Stadium, marking time until the arrival of the Braves from Milwaukee. Again, Skip Carey. I did the last, in 65, we did only the home games uh, because on whenever the Cracker team was on the road, the Braves, the Milwaukee Braves, who were going to be the Atlanta Braves next year, brought radio and TV into the southeast. So I don't remember whether they finished the season at home or on the road. I do remember that in, in 65 we played in Atlanta Fulton County Stadium and that at the time that you know they had to throw that ballpark together because they thought they were going to have the major league club in 1965 and a lot of things really weren't finished 
when we started, and it was really a shame because by then nobody wanted to see the minor league club. They wanted to see the big league club on on television and listen to them on the radio and playing in that 55,000 seat stadium with three or 400 people there was was really an experience. I remember the night uh, very vividly sitting uh, uh, on uh, the boxcar in right field. It was Johnny Hill from Douglasville night. In other words, it was Johnny Hill night at Old Parcelian Ballpark. And uh, the ballpark was jam-packed. He was a very popular ball player a good infielder, and a good hitter. He never hit well enough to to make it in the major leagues. I think he went up with the Pittsburgh Pirates for a cup of coffee. But this particular night, which was Johnny Hill's night, the first time up, he peppered the signboards in right field. Now, the, the signboards in right field had three tiers. One, another tier, and another tier. The very strong left-handed hitters would hit home runs over the, the third tier, up on the railroad tracks. Some was able to just lift it above the first or second tier of signs. And good, strong line drive hitters could hit that ball, and you could hear it hit that signboard, which was usually a double. And that night, he peppered those signboards. Every time Johnny Hill would come up, he'd hit a line drive, and it would hit up against that 10, the 10 sign, out in right field, boom! Sometimes I wish for the good old days. And then I think, oh, life is so much better now than it was then. But uh, I don't know. I, I really think then that the players, maybe the travel, you know, they used to travel by train. They could talk baseball with everybody on the train. And they had, now they fly and, and they, they just don't have time to just, you know, I don't know what it is. It's just hard to describe, really, the difference in the crackers in modern-day baseball. There is no museum for the Atlanta Crackers, no place to see the 17 pennants they won. Neither, it seems, are there any bad memories of the team that captured the hearts of Atlantans over the span of six decades. As one passes the site of Old Ponce de Leon Park, now covered by acres of asphalt, there remains one spot of green, the magnolia tree that once upon a time marked dead center field for the Atlanta Crackers. For Southwind, this is Ted Rubenstein. Remembering the Atlanta Crackers. Special thanks to sports buff Ted Rubenstein, who conducted the interviews for this special edition of Southwind. Southwind presents the new sounds from the old Confederacy and is produced in the studios of WABE FM Atlanta. If you'd like to get on the Southwind mailing list, please write us at Southwind, WABE, 740 Bismarck Road, Atlanta, Georgia, 30324. In Atlanta, I'm Boyd Lewis.